Um, thank you, Sister Denise and Vandy. Let us welcome everyone to the session three of the Power of Thought. Sister Denise, would you like to say something first? Well, it's um, a very, very deep subject. It's the foundation of everything we do, really. And so we really didn't complete what we wanted to do. And therefore, we are doing two more sessions this month on the power of thought. And um, maybe there's still more to go, but I think that we will cover at least everything that came up in the write-up. So welcome, everyone. And thank you, Sister Rose. So Sister Denise has written, uh, I think, a few weeks, few weeks ago, the purpose of EGY. And I think it is useful to read that together before we officially start the session today. The purpose of EGY, EGY stands for Explorations of Gyan and Yoga. Important aspects of Gyan and Yoga are selected each month for gaining deeper understanding, background, how to use the concepts, apply them in practical life and in our individual spiritual practice. The purpose is to articulate Gyan in the context of Western civilization and to show the relevance of these ancient concepts in our life in the confluence age. The Gyan and yoga given to us by Shiv Baba through Brahma Baba is presented in the context of Indian civilization and Hindu bhakti. So the background and comparison needs to be clarified. Shiv Baba calls this yin and yoga the original knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita. So this has to be clarified and the contrast and difference made clear to people who did not necessarily grow up in the world of India. Shiv Baba, the ocean of knowledge, has given a vast encyclopedia of information about the soul, about himself, incorporeal God, the three worlds, the cycle of time, eternity, immortality, the philosophy of karma, the future civilization, the huge world of yoga, remembrance, the fire of purification of the soul, attainment of the karmatic stage, and so many other concepts. Those of us who have been pursuing this path since several decades have much interest in plumbing its depths so that we can advance and progress as we aspire to. We want to understand the study and practice of Raj Yoga at the level that enables us to become the embodiment of Gyan and Yoga. Thank you so much. Um, well, what I thought I would do is just read um, sentence by sentence the ones that uh, we pulled out that didn't get looked at in the previous um, uh, in the previous sessions and go into it because these are quite deep. They're in a way psychological uh, because the um, more psychological aspects, our feelings, our emotions, uh, the thoughts that we have, how they're triggered. Um, this needs to be understood as a part of spiritual practice. Because, yes, we have a lot of theoretical knowledge, but the key, I think, the important thing is the process of making that theoretical knowledge into a practical part of our being. And this is something that Baba emphasizes again and again. Uh, but nevertheless, a lot of people are very um, content with being theoretical, but the problem is you can't really make progress if you just keep, keep it at a theoretical level. So the first sentence that uh, I will look at, and uh, you can also look at it with me, 
be continuously aware of the pre-thought feelings and triggers that still have power over you, which could be from deep traumas, from karmic accounts, conditioning, addictions, and social attitudes that limit your freedom to be who you really are. So this is really very important. Um, before you get a thought, which you're aware of, there are many other things that happen. And I want us to be conscious of those because your conscious thoughts are provoked by something. And usually it is a sense impression. And as many of you know from the Murli notes, one of the key components of the Gita is to say that sense impressions are deceptive. And one of the key components of science and materialism, psychology, most of psychology, is that sense impressions are not deceptive. And so you have a big contradiction here. And uh, so we have to deal with that contradiction and decide what's true, what's real. So as far as we know from the Gita and um, the knowledge that Baba gives is the knowledge of the Gita, uh, there are some mistakes in the Gita, quite a lot of mistakes, but this one isn't a mistake, <laughs> so it's important. Anything that comes into your mind through a sense impression comes in through your eyes, ears, nose, mouth, fingers. Uh, these are physical sensations. And a physical sensation is associated and connected with other things that are in your memory, in your subconscious, and the human soul has lots and lots and lots of levels. And according to spirituality, we all reincarnate. This is very clear in the Gita also. The soul reincarnates. The soul is permanent. And everything that you experience in the material world, the location of the experience is your mind. And um, to illustrate this very well, there is a very famous film of Kurosawa, a Japanese very famous filmmaker. And um, this film is about a murder which was uh, taken, it took place and uh, it was witnessed by four different people. And none of the four saw it as it was. And so this film is to examine how people's perception is um, mostly not telling them what's actually in front of them because your perception is um, influenced by many things, and that includes traumas, social conditioning, addiction, social attitudes, and so on. So you will see what you see through all these filters. And as a Raj Yogi, it's very important to be conscious of the filters, and that is very difficult because they are... Um, invisible. Um, most people are absolutely unconscious of them. Even if they know about it, they're still unconscious about it. So the process of experiencing things, uh, scenes in the world through your sense perception, to be able to experience it as it is, is um, something that requires 
you to be detached from yourself and that's practically impossible but that is what is required so what is possible for us and how should we do this um so first of all let's look at these pre-thought feelings so you the the speed of thought is lightning so you hear something smell something see something it's going to trigger all sorts of associations and all kinds of memories which you will not be conscious of but they will drive your response your feelings your interpretation and um, then you will see or hear or feel that uh, scene and respond to it not according to it but according to all of these other elements that um, create distortions in your perception and uh, so therefore according to this it is essentially impossible to be objective you are far more subjective than you can realize and that includes um even the disciplines of uh, psychology and um uh, all, all things to do with um, consciousness that are on the level of medicine uh, conventional medicine so to um, be aware of these things is important because as soon as you're aware of um, something that is distorting your perception you have the possibility to uh, counteract that to neutralize it and to um, interact with that scene much more as it is and much less as you have been impacted by all kinds of things that are nothing to do with that scene I think one of the easiest approaches to this is to look at prejudice uh, because I think people have identified prejudices and um, I think prejudice is quite tangible so for example there is race prejudice there's class prejudice caste prejudice um, prejudice to do with gender that's a big one um, prejudice to do with um, whether you perceive somebody to be mentally uh, normal or not normal there's a lot of prejudice against mental health issues um, there are prejudice against religion prejudice against um, nationality uh, many many different um, kinds of prejudices so that when you experience a person who fits in a category that you are prejudiced against you will no longer be able to see that person as they are but your perception of that person is influenced by your prejudices and your behavior towards that person is entirely on the basis of your prejudice and therefore you will perform negative karma and then you will go into debt to that person and so there is a great advantage in identifying what your prejudices are uh, so that whenever something comes along that you know is connected with one of your prejudices because you've worked it out then you can um, compensate for that and neutralize it in your interaction with the person and this is the meaning of the raj yoga practice in which it is said see the soul but if you see the body then you see the gender the religion the social level the race the class um, the 
education level, the financial level, all these different things. That is what you see. And you do not see the being. You do not see the person. And therefore, Baba says, practice always to see the soul. Now, also, you may have a karmic account with a soul in addition to the prejudices. Because how you get a karmic account is because of negative karma triggered by prejudice, maybe in another life. So all of these different parts get mixed in to what you have in front of you and you are unaware of it. So we have to make ourselves aware and then compensate for that and then really see the soul. So this requires the powers, especially the power of discrimination. And because most people are not completely under their own control, most people are quickly under the influence of emotions which are triggered by these um, perceptions under the influence of prejudice. So you have to be very agile and very fast to catch those before they take you over. And this is the meaning of when Baba says, be a Tivra Purusharati. Now, Tivra Purusharati is usually uh, translated as intense effort maker, but in fact, Tivra does not mean intense, it means fast. So you have to be faster, if possible, faster than your mind. Can you do that? Because the mind is instant. And you have to be faster than instant. How can you be faster than instant? That happens when you have good yoga. Because one of the effects of good yoga is that you can slow down time. And that's very interesting. Time is also something that we perceive through our sense perception. Um, but slowing down time is an experience that you get by the practice of detaching from sense perception. And then you're able to see the whole. Uh, one of the titles that we have is Swa Darshan Chakra Dhari, which means that you are the person who has taken possession and they are able to see the cycle of the self, which includes the past, present, and future. Now, when you see the cycle of the self and you spin the cycle of the self, that brings you to your original condition. And to be able to spin the cycle in a stable way uh, is said to be your original state of being. So this is something that you can aspire to, but you can't have right away. It takes a lot of practice and a lot of figuring out because this is an instrument called a yantra. Spinning the cycle is an instrument that enables you to be independent of prejudices because you're able to see the whole and you're able to see it as it is. So this is a very important practice connected with the instruction, see the soul. And the soul is the cycle of all the births. And then you see the original condition you yourself are in your original condition. And then these triggers are actually neutralized by spinning the cycle. But to get to that point is quite a lot of work. And so first of all, we have to consider the concept. And then we have to observe ourselves over a long period of time 
how we um, act in different circumstances. So that's um, about prejudice, but uh, along with prejudice, there are also different kinds of traumas. And uh, I think most people don't think that they have psychological traumas, but according to um, different statistics that have been done by sociologists, it's pretty much everyone has experienced some level of trauma and it affects your perception. And so we need to be able to notice uh, if our perception is being affected. And say, for example, you're in a situation and you feel anxiety. So anxiety is a sign that there is uh, trauma, unresolved trauma sitting in the soul. It's like a wound in the soul. And so if you have anxiety about a situation that doesn't warrant anxiety, which is different from a situation that does warrant anxiety, when you, you come into a normal situation, you feel anxiety, this will distort your perception and it will change the way that you interact with those people or those situations. Um, uh, these traumas, um, sometimes to do with childhood, a lot of the time is to do with childhood. And um, a, a, a lot of people who've experienced childhood trauma, they sort of pretend it didn't happen. So one has to be quite introspective to um, sit with the self. And when you're doing your self-checking, this is also a good time, um, go over any, any experience that you had where you felt anxiety and yet it wasn't a circumstance that warrants uh, anxiety. That means there is some kind of trauma that was triggered by the circumstance or what you saw, what you heard. And um, so this creates this pre-thought feeling and then uh, it means that this trauma is actually causing you to behave in a certain way, which you wouldn't behave if that trauma was not driving your feelings. And so it, it Im impacts how you speak to people, how you feel about things, all of this, you see. So it's important to be aware about it in order to be really free to act according to your will, according to who you are. Um, addictions are connected with trauma um, because addictions are basically coping mechanisms that you develop to deal with trauma. And then you forget that that's what they are and you become caught up in the addiction. Uh, and anytime that trauma is triggered by something, it'll also trigger the addiction. And then you come under the influence of that addiction and you're not free, you see. And the only solution to these things is to increase your level and quality and amount of yoga, which means you have to understand what yoga is. So this is another area to go into. Uh, there are social attitudes, and social attitudes are um, assumptions uh, that are agreed upon by the society you live in, which may diminish you or put you up or in some way make you have a sense of self that is actually very different from the reality. So these social attitudes um, include a lot of um, what I call toxic conventional morality. 
and uh, the society will put pressure on people to be a certain way which is actually karmically not correct but socially desirable so you have a conflict there and you may um, be inclined to being karmically correct but you don't know how to deal with these social pressures that force you to be incorrect and that creates a lot of stress and so it limits uh, your freedom to be who you really are so let's move to the next one and um it's a fairly simple sentence but um i think quite important self-deception is an obstacle an inaccurate interpretation of perceptions. So we deceive ourselves because we perceive something to be a certain way, which it actually isn't. And we may have a feeling, say, for example, you have a feeling of self-doubt or you're not confident about what you have to do. You may be very capable, but because of not being confident, you believe that you're not capable. And that's a kind of self-deception. And it can work the opposite way as well. You may think that you're wonderful, marvelous, and fantastic, and you know exactly what to do and blah, blah, blah. And you want to impose yourself on the circumstance, but actually you're out of line you haven't understood and you cause a lot of problems and difficulties because of that to, to yourself and other people. And so this is the inaccurate interpretation of perception. And why does a person um, perceive or, or interpret their perceptions inaccurately is because of what we were talking about before, the prejudices, the assumptions, the social attitudes. And also it may, you may be impacted by your position. For example, if you're in a high position relative to the other people that you're interacting with, your perception will be uh, filtered through this position you have and you may um, disregard the people in a lower position uh, to your detriment and to theirs too. In the same way, you may be in a low position and believe that you don't have any right to express yourself because that's how it has been presented. And so what you do have a right to has been taken away by a social attitude or a corporate uh, principle or whatever. So you get a lot of um, contradictions between what people think is right and good and what's actually right and good. And that creates confusion and distress in the people uh, which can turn into some or another form of ego, inferiority, superiority, and then the interaction between people goes wrong, you come into karmic debt, and there's a kind of knot that ties itself around people, uh, which is very difficult to come out of, but Raj Yoga is all about coming out of that. Uh, so let's go to the next one. And... Um, this is um, perceptions are interpreted according to religious and moral perspectives. And uh, the problem with religious and moral perspectives is that they're biased and especially they're gender biased and race biased. And um, even in terms of your social status, there is a bias there. And so therefore, because of these biases, um, what, what's actually in front of you, you will not see, but you will look at it through the filter of the bias. 
and then you create a morality or the society develops a morality which is determined by these biases and the biases are set in um, the scriptures and um, principles of the religion and yet they are uh, wrong so it can be morally right legally right but spiritually wrong sometimes you get something which is morally right legally wrong then you have uh, the, the law is going to punish you for doing the right thing because the law is determined by the religion uh, which looks at for example especially in gender bias uh, the religions are very strong on this and so the the female is considered as an object that is a piece of property and can be used as you would use any other piece of property and that you don't have any rights, you see. But because it is not true that a female is a piece of property, a female is a genderless soul in a female body. And a male is a genderless soul in a male body, but the religions don't see it that way. They just see bodies, which means all the religions are actually body conscious but they all think that they're spiritual and they think that god created bodies and um, if someone was created in the image of god that's a man that makes god into a man actually god is not a man or a woman god is genderless but it's very very difficult for gender biased people which is almost everyone to actually uh, conceive of a, a being who is genderless, that, that's out of range for so many people. And yet in Raj Yoga, it is said, see the soul. That means see the being who is genderless, colorless, classless, religionless, nationalityless. You see, that is completely out of range for the overwhelming majority of people. So when you come into Raj Yoga, you need to develop this. And some people develop it, but most people don't, because they don't think very deeply about what the spiritual knowledge is. They just go along with what everybody else is doing, and everybody else is still mostly caught up in um, not being able to make any difference between religion and spirituality. So they will hear the knowledge, they'll know the knowledge theoretically, but in terms of all of their behaviors and their sort of knee-jerk reaction, they will remain in um, gender bias, race bias, social bias, economic bias, all of these things. And therefore, no matter how good your theory is, you can't make any progress. You can't develop. You just remain in the status quo. And so making this change is a very big deal. And most people think, oh, change, you know, no, it's not so easy at all, because you have to be able to become free from invisible, intangible conditionings that have impacted you since practically before you were born. And who knows how many births uh, this has been going on. So all of these things are really very big. And that's why the next sentence, it requires much strength and clarity to remain in the soul conscious position. So when you're listening to a morally or you're listening to a class and somebody's talking about soul consciousness, you can kind of shift into it for a second or two. But your default position is body conscious. Everyone's is. 
So it's actually something that one must do consciously, moment by moment, is bring oneself into a soul conscious state and check, am I really soul conscious? Am I in touch with myself? Am I aware of the um, force of my prejudices and what they're doing to me um, on a subconscious level? You see, so we have to make ourselves aware of what's going on subconsciously. And it takes only a second to be distracted from that. Because the soul is in contact with the sense organs at all times. And as soon as anything happens, a sound, a sight, a smell, anything, you're instantly back in body consciousness. So again and again, bring yourself back to soul consciousness, consolidate that in your meditation. And it, it's a constant self-checking, which requires a lot of energy. And so you can do it for a few minutes. And the idea is to be patient with the self. And again and again to um, bring oneself into that. And it does require a lot of patience. It's very easy to get impatient with the self and say, oh, this is not working. It is working, but it's not an instant thing. It's something that requires practice over a long period of time. So you need the strength and you need the clarity and along with that, the patience. So the next one, um, ego is a reaction to stress. Now I um, mentioned this because generally speaking, um, a lot of people say um, ego is a vice and therefore if you have ego it means you're a bad person and stop it but it's not like that what is ego uh, different people define it in many different ways but I think one reasonable description is that it's a kind of flip-flopping between feeling superior or feeling inferior and uh, the person who has ego is spiritually wounded and damaged. And the ego is like um, a covering or a mask to um, cover that over so that people do not see that you are wounded because there is shame connected with these wounds. And... Uh, uh, various other uh, other things um, you can be accused of lots of things which will trigger your uh, wound and then you have to cover that because you have to look a certain way in order to be socially acceptable and if you're not then you will be um, considered unacceptable you will be excluded you will be marginalized and that's added to the pain that you already have from your wound and so there is stress that uh, is added to the wound and that stress will get the person to come into the state of ego excuse me um so sometimes this mask will be you'll make yourself look like you're better than everybody else because that's a kind of protection and other times you may flip into the inferiority uh, where you will um, uh, not actually come into your power. You will diminish yourself because so many people have diminished you and they will accuse you of being egotistical and they will humiliate you and so on. So you go into this inferiority thing. And this happens very much to people who are on the receiving end of other people's prejudice. So women will do this where there is gender uh, bias. People of color will do this where there's racial bias. People who are economically deprived will do this where they're surrounded by people who are rich. 
and all like this. So you have a kind of society made of people who have all sorts of ego, uh, some of which are in the superiority, some of which are in the inferiority, and you have a drama of ego clashes going on, and it becomes um, a matter of um, broken communication, isolation, loneliness, um, inability to understand what's going on, why you get into that situation, and so on. So you may blame the self, or you may blame the other, and uh, all of it comes down to the things that we've been talking about before, the lack of accurate perception, the stress, the wounds uh, from different kinds of trauma. And so instead of real, doing real spiritual work, people start using the moralistic and um, uh, using religiosity to get people into line which only makes everything worse so we really do need to know the difference between spiritual and all these other things that call themselves spiritual but aren't so again you need very good power of discrimination and uh, keep on the work of building up your spiritual power and your resilience so um, the next sentence um, carries us forward in that because the religious moral angle on life leads to an oppressed, constricted, guilt and shame-based social world. So this is the context that um, a lot of people are in. And um, you don't really um, know how much the religious and moral angle, which calls itself right, is causing oppression, constriction, guilt, shame, which are wrong. And so you want to be right. So you go into the religious moral angle on things, but in the name of being right, or in the name of God, or in the name of um, what people believe is morality, um, and which is morality. Morality is basically public opinion about what's right and what's wrong um, based on preconception, prejudice, uh, scriptures, and so on. And so it's it's very, very difficult to come out of because people cannot see what's really there mm -hmm. and so when she baba starts to talk to us about the soul and tell us to see the soul and then begins to talk to us about the laws of spirituality talks to us about karma talks to us about reincarnation this information clashes really strongly with the um the morality and with the religion and people don't like this kind of clash so the majority of people who want to study spirituality as soon as they come across this clash they will revert immediately to the religious and the moral aspect and then the spiritual part is eclipsed and the person is thinking they're doing a lot of spiritual work, but they're not. And so that's self-deception. And you can see that it's not an easy thing uh, because you have to face. You need the power to face. A lot of people don't have the power to face. You have to face the fact that things you believed were right are actually not all that right. And things that you believe are wrong are often not all that wrong. And that means you have to really rethink your um, principles, rethink your personal ethical policy. This is a big job. And most people really don't want to do that as much too hard. 
and it means that you will not be like everybody else. And on the one hand, you say, well, everybody's in trouble, but if you don't want to be like everybody else and come out of trouble, then you will be different. And people don't really like to be different. So maybe this is why there is the expression that you prefer the hell you know to the heaven you don't know. And so these are obstacles that uh, one encounters if you really want to um, move forward spiritually. So let's look at the next one. Um, it follows on from what we mentioned before. Some children and families are raised to believe they are superior to others on the basis of their skin color, musculature, social position, possessions. And they're also trained to be violent, abusive, misogynist, racist, and distorted in other ways through propaganda. Now, this is something that has been enormously exacerbated in the social media because uh, social media is about people expressing themselves and people who have very strong opinions, which may or may not be beneficial to other people, but there's strong opinions. They um, This comes from people's feelings of superiority. And um, this is um, pushed out on the social media and and what we are seeing is a lot of people are being really damaged by the enormous amount of this kind of violence and misogyny and racism and other types of um, harsh attitudes being displayed uh, quite um, openly uh, without feeling that there's anything wrong with it thinking that's my self-expression I can do what I want I can make people feel as bad as possible um, because I am right everybody else is not important um, so it's very arrogant uh, selfish and it has created a lot of problems and you have a clash between the concept of freedom of expression and the concept of um, um, being unselfish, being um, respectful, all of that. And these, these have come into conflict. They were intended to be um, aligned with each other, but, but they've actually come into conflict and, and nobody really knows quite what to do with this situation. So it is a challenge and a person needs to be really strong in their own sense of self and um, be very sensitive to um, the feelings of other people. And it's very, very difficult in this day and age because circumstances have become very tense, very violent, very aggressive, stressful, and it's increasing. Um, and so there doesn't seem to be a solution. For a Raj Yogi, the solution to most of these things is uh, understand uh, how to use these circumstances to intensify your own sense of self, your resilience, um, strengthen your yoga, because you have to deal with this. It's not going to go away. And you can't run away from it. You can't hide from it. You have to really have good powers. So power of discrimination, power to face power to accommodate, power to endure, all of these powers are becoming more and more useful uh, to the person who practices spirituality. Um, let us look at the next one. This again connected with this idea of ego. So many moral and religious people believe that humiliation makes a person egoless. 
And so you'll have somebody who thinks that they're the most moral and religious person and they see somebody who they think has an ego problem and they will, you know, humiliate them thinking that it's, it's good for you. You know, I, I'm doing this for your benefit. And they will behave in a very violent, um, insensitive and cruel manner. Uh, and they will justify that by thinking that, well, this is because the person has ego and I have the right and duty to humiliate them, to make them into a better person. But this is actually called bullying. But there are a lot of people who, who think that way. Um, but what happens when you do this to somebody who may be protecting themselves with a shell of ego you humiliate them, that's not going to remove that shell, that's going to make it thicker, harder, stronger, and more impenetrable. And this creates more and more social isolation. So it's absolutely counterproductive, but yet people really believe in it, especially uh, people who come into a position of power and they will abuse their position and humiliate people and um, they're the ones who actually have the ego <laughs> because one definition of ego that's often mentioned in India is they say ego is trampling over other people's feelings and I think it's, it's important to remember that um, trampling over other people's feelings is not um, a good way to go so uh, this um, victim becomes inferior more and more into defensiveness, more and more into inferiority complexes. So the next one, um, which is the last one that we have uh, selected, um, a soul in pain with all the powers of endurance, accommodation, tolerance, etc., is not distorted. It means you really have to manage your pain. Um, managing your pain means your pain is there full on and you can handle it. Because when people can't handle their pain, that's when they jump into the ego defense mechanism. But if you have endurance, accommodation, tolerance, then that pain is not going to move you away from your reality you will stay in your reality that takes a very powerful soul to do that and you grow into that slowly so such a soul has their self-respect you will not be pushed into inferiority by other people's bad behavior you have your independence that's a kind of soul consciousness where you're even independent of the pain, independent of the bad behavior of the other people who are trying to um, humiliate you or something like this. Um, you also have your freedom. It means you are able to be in contact with yourself, the soul, in contact with the knowledge, you'll know which is the right piece of knowledge to use at the right time. You'll be in your power and you will be proactive, not reactive. This is a really powerful individual and it takes a lot of time and effort to reach that point. But this is one of the very important um, results of the practice of Raj Yoga. So such a soul has clear perception and is not deceived by anything going on in the drama that can be perceived through the senses. What that means is that they're strong and clear so that their wounds may be triggered, but it won't move them away from their strength and their clarity, you see. So the soul is neutral. The soul is not deceived by what you can hear and feel and and you know deception triggers you to jump into 
a moral reaction. And you will say, this is bad, this is wrong, this is something like that. And you will have an antagonistic relationship with what's going on. And all of the energy in that um, circumstance gets wasted and um, it's counterproductive. So this is really the condition that you are aiming for, I think. Um, a soul at the end of the cycle um, has lost almost all its power, has got into all sorts of karmic situations and has passed through many difficulties. So therefore there will definitely be pain, uh, but you're with God, you're under his uh, care and instruction, and he's there to make you strong and uh, experienced and able to handle yourself as a master. And so this um, practice is not necessarily easy. Uh, and the circumstances that you have to handle are not necessarily pleasant, but all of this is part of the process of becoming the powerful, free, independent, resilient, clear, um, unimpeded person who is really in their power. So this was all of the ones that I wanted to go over. So I think I'm going to now turn it back to Sister Rose and Sister Vanji, um, and uh, we can discuss all these things. Om Shanti. Om Shanti, Sister Denise. Um, we can have a few minutes of silence first. Yes. So just go to the self, the soul for a moment, just be the light. I'm not this body. I am not all the things that have happened to me. Denise, I was really about to say that um, listening to the very detailed explanation, it really is not easy, Raj Yoga. Right. <laughs> A lot of uh, attention is needed um, for the self. A lot of inward reflection observation, and really not much time to look outside. Well, I think we're all the time pulled outside and we have to, um, I think in a way we have to give up the idea that this is easy ride yoga because I think it makes us a bit careless and we assume that easy ride yoga means um, it should be easy so I don't have to make any effort. And so why do we hear about effort? But there's another ex uh, uh, a translation of the word sahaj. 
uh, that I discovered, you know, Sahaj normally means easy, but it also means in the context of people. And um, this is where I think all the difficulties arise when you're in the context of people. And the opposite of Raj Yoga is Hatha Yoga, which is practiced by the sannyasis who go away from the context of people because it's too hard to practice spirituality in the context of people who are not practicing spirituality. So I always keep that as my interpretation of the word um, Sahaj. When you, Sister Denise, were talking about the pre-thought feelings and you were giving um, the many layers uh, of experiences in the recent past and in the long ago past in terms of because we reincarnate, uh, it looks like there's a huge amount of influences that makes us more subjective rather than looking at objective reality. Um, so that uh, I understand you saying much of what we see in the world are our construal social construction. Um, is it really important to be subjective? Uh, sorry, to be objective. How important is that in my um, journey so that I don't lose track of the sense of self, the real sense of self? I, I think that it's pretty much impossible to be objective because of all the influences. But I, I think that there are different degrees or types of subjectivity. Uh, I think that ultimately you are subjective. You have to be subjective because all experiences are experienced in your own mind. They're not experienced out there. You know, and, and the assumption of the scientific community and most people is that reality is an objective thing. And this is because they do not know that you experience it in your mind. They assume that what you see is what everybody else sees, but of course they don't. Everyone sees that scene um, in their in their way, which is very different from what it actually is, which is why I brought up the matter of that um, uh, Kurosawa film uh, the the um, soul conscious self who's really um, compensating for the distortions I think is like the undistorted subjectivity I, I, I think is what we should go for because no matter what, I am me. And I will see a situation, maybe I will see it with compassion, somebody else will see it with glee, you know, that they're happy that somebody else is in trouble. Um, it, it really depends on um, who you are, where you're coming from, what kind of person you are, which is behind and separate from the distortions that happen through the effect of life, you know? Is it possible to stop associating with things which have crossed before like trauma experiences? Of course, theoretically it's possible, but I think that, you know, what we are trying to do here is to heal. Mm -hmm. Anytime there's a trauma, there's a wound. And so one is in some respects a wounded healer, but at least one is a, a wounded who has to become healed. And in order to become healed, I think one needs to revisit the trauma and I think that the trauma will come again in many different formats many different it will present itself in different ways so that you get multiple opportunities 
to deal with it and practice using the power to face, using your resilience. Um, you know, sometimes something that may have been traumatic as a child is not so traumatic if you experience the same thing as an adult. But when you experience childhood trauma, it locks you into that child state and prevents you from growing up and becoming free. So a very important part of the healing process is to grow up and um, become undistorted from this injury that happened in a very young age. And this is possible. Um, in the Murlis, um, you, you hear about healing the body from bodily illnesses through yoga, but it, it applies to um, wounds to the soul as well. But that's not usually talked about in the Murlis because they just talk about physical things because the there's a lot of taboo uh, in India against um, mental wounds, you see, and, and uh, it's one of the prejudices that's there that if you have been um, emotionally traumatized, you are a bad person. <laughs> Not necessarily, but that's one of the prejudices. It's also there in the Western world, but it's very strong in India. Sister Denise, in, in this uh, regard, how do I understand the phrase past is past? Sometimes people interpret this phrase past is past to mean um, it happened a long time ago, so avoid dealing with it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't see the point of doing that. I think that's a very superficial interpretation of past is past. But what I think it's telling us is you need to deal with all the things that happened to you in the past that are unresolved because you cannot let it go until it's resolved. And so I think you work on it um, to resolve it, to work through it, and then let it go. You know, some people, they don't want to let it go having worked through it, but you, you need to you you have to move on but you have to do the work of working through it letting it go and I think this is why we are given the knowledge of drama because drama is all about it's a kind of tragedy comedy isn't it so there's all kinds of big dramas that happen big tragedies that happen um, but you know you're a soul and you you know, there's a there's a little um, three sentences that I came upon. I, it, it, they they came to me, um, which was very strengthening at one point. Uh, to really realize, no one can kill me because I'm immortal. I'm indestructible. So, uh, however many people try to destroy me, put me down, whatever, whatever, it's not possible. So. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Um, the second one is uh, no one can corrupt me because it uh, doesn't matter how much pressure or temptation or whatever somebody puts on me um, and, and the price I have to pay for resisting being corrupted, but um, I can do that and nobody can corrupt me because I will not come under anyone else's thumb, which is why they want to corrupt you in the first place. They want power over you. And the third one is no one can break my spirit. So, you know, life is all about predators and prey. And so you don't want to be a predator. You don't want to be a prey either. So that means you have to be very strong and resilient. And so these three phrases I found very good. And I used them for some time, you know, to come out of um, being susceptible to people just wanting to take you down, mess you up, take control of you, blah, 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 all those things, which is very common in this world. But... Um, you have to really understand who you are, and they can't. 
No one can kill me, no one can corrupt me, and no one can destroy my spirit. Exactly. Remember that. It's a good mantra. <laughs> <laughs> or in, in the many Murlis, we hear Maya. Is Maya from what you have uh, in your discourse today? Can we understand Maya now to be when there is self-deception, when there is distortion and things like that? Because we, we used to understand Maya as the illusion that can uh, yeah, deceive you, your senses deceiving you. So uh, can you please elaborate on that, Sister Denise? Yeah, all of it is there, but um, this word Maya literally means um, that which is not there. So this is why it's described as illusion. And But I think there's another thing to take into account. Um, you know, some people talk about the force of evil, the power of evil, the dark forces, all of that. It's real, and uh, sometimes you will encounter it and get pretty scared. And so you need to be able to manage this thing. And so where does it come from? It's uh, the accumulation of the loss of light, loss of understanding, loss of purity of all the souls throughout the world. And the um, intensity of that force of darkness is equal to the light of God. And that is pretty enormous. And so it will come along and um, disturb you every so often. And uh, you need to be not afraid. You need to take maximum amount of light because you know if you look at it from a calculation point of view if the force of light and the force of darkness are equal and you are one and you connect yourself to the force of light then you're always going to be greater than the force of darkness by definition so that's all you have to do because god plus one is always more powerful than any amount of dark force so remember that and then you you're able to face it down and um, you know it's not very often that people encounter full-on force of darkness but what we're seeing in the world today is that it, it is increasing it is intensifying it's getting really scary for a lot of people but those of us who uh, know, who have access to God, who practice to draw strength and light and um, to live in a good way, um, we have to face that down. This, is, this becomes our, uh, our work, you see. And, uh, and it is said, you know, you have to conquer sin and death. And it's a very much part of Christianity. And in, um, in India, they use the word conquering death and conquering Maya. It's the same thing. So how is Maya sin? Is because it, uh, this darkness is something that arises whenever any negative action is performed. And there's a lot of them being performed as we speak. And so it's really, really getting strong. But it always is um, of equal power when it's in its full strength, equal power to the power of God. So you connect yourself with God, you are always going to be more powerful than it. But one must pay attention on that connection with God. That is yoga. Comment here. Um... It would really be lovely to hear an example of using the Swadarshan Chakra, understanding this practice in the right way. 
You know, uh, a lot of people, they ask for examples, and that's a cultural thing. Um, based on the assumption that if you have an example of it, you'll understand it. But I personally don't think that that works. Um, what you need to do rather than have an example of it, because I really don't think you can have an example of it, you need to figure out how it works. You see, the Swadarshan Chakradhara is a gyroscope. And an example of a gyroscope is a gyroscope. So <laughs> you just have to understand what is the function and what is the physics of a gyroscope. And then you will understand it. So the physics of a gyroscope is it spins. And anything that spins remains in the same plane. And the best example of a gyroscope is a bicycle. And I think almost everyone knows how to ride a bicycle. And if you're riding the bicycle and the wheels are turning, you will be upright. And um, if you want to turn a corner, you just bend over slightly and it will turn the corner because that's how a gyroscope works. And if it's not turning, you will not stand up. So the Swadarshan Chakra is a gyroscope, which is horizontal, not a, a bicycle, it's vertical, right? This is horizontal. And the Swadarshan Chakra literally means it is the cycle. You are the, well, the Swadarshan Chakra, the Hari, is the person who possesses and sees the cycle of the self. And that means that you can see the totality of yourself all the way from your brightest to your darkest. And when you just see yourself as you are right now, you're seeing your darkest, which is not the whole picture. So Swadarshan Chakra means I am the soul who has been through the Golden Age, through the Silver Age, through the Copper Age, through the Iron Age. And if you look at yourself as I am a golden age soul, you will say, okay, I'm already perfect and I don't have any vices, but you might because you're not seeing the whole picture. You have to see the whole picture. Then spinning the cycle. So if you have a spinning top and you paint that spinning top in the colors of the rainbow, like little um, pie chart thing, and you spin it, all those colors, when you spin it, they will be white. And that's just optics. Now, um, Baba will use all these examples um, on the physical to help you to understand on the spiritual. So a spinning top is um, something that, any child will have so you know that it has to be spinning in order to stay upright and if it's painted with all the colors of the rainbow it will look white when it's spinning but not when it's not spinning so when you're spinning the cycle of the self you need to be aware of all your births not just this one and you can be aware of all your births because you're in the confluence age and you have the information this is the only period of time where you can actually bear to know the truth because you've actually passed through all the dark part and you're on the edge of the light part. If you would know this 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 400 years ago, it'd be unbearable because you just know that you have X number of hundreds of years of darkness to go into, but now you're on the end. So you're going into the light, which means you can handle it. Um, but you have to um, work with this yantra. It is an instrument. And the way that you understand an instrument is by playing with it. And uh, 
but gradually you become expert in uh, making it work for you. That's the meaning of an instrument. Thank you, Sister Denise. Uh, there are some questions here regarding trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, one is due to past trauma, it often isn't easy to go into yoga or to remain there. Even therapy could help only a bit. So what else could someone in this kind of circumstances do? Um, when you go into yoga, you cause the trauma, the wound, the feelings, the upset to come to the surface. And um, it's supposed to be like that. And what you need to do is to let them come up as much as you can manage it and practice to be the detached observer of these things because this is how very slowly, incrementally, you will become free from them. Because um, there are a lot of other emotions that are peripheral to the trauma itself. For example, you have a trauma which produces shame. Mm -hmm. So shame is because of the society, not because of the trauma. And you need to make a separation between the trauma and the feelings that you have as a direct result of the social attitudes towards you, which are usually worse than the trauma itself, very often. And then you have to deal with the secondary trauma. Uh, I, know, I know it happens in, in law, you know, anybody who gets raped or something, the law will put them through it multiple times and re-traumatize them endlessly, which is about the most awful thing that the law could do, but it does that because of um, being patriarchally based. And um, it really is beginning slightly to um, be aware about that, but, but mostly, no, the victim is repeatedly punished by the society far more than the perpetrator. And that is my problem with conventional morality, conventional religion, it is designed to um, damage the victim. And um, in many cases, the perpetrator goes free. And uh, then it gives them the um, feeling that they're allowed to do that because <laughs> the law is on their side. And the law is not based on anything other than the prejudices. So, which are in the religions. And so the whole thing really needs to be um, worked on at an individual level because we're not here to change the society in a macrocosmic level. We're, what we're here to do is to empower the individual to neutralize on the self as much as possible, the impact of a society that operates based on a, a lot of ignorance and you can't do anything about that. But in yoga, slowly, slowly get these things to come up so that you slowly, slowly are able to bear them and be more and more neutral about them and let it take however much time it takes. Yeah. But a good therapist will help if you can find one. How to deal with a past that is not known consciously by the self, by recall, because it happened at a young age, like age one or two, but the memory of it is retold by others, like parents, extended family, and yet it happened to the self. So how to go about dealing with this? Well, any kind of trauma will leave scars and um, 
sometimes a trauma at a very, very young age will um, come into the memory much, much later on when you're kind of ready for it. So I think um, a better way to go is not necessarily to try to deal with that trauma that's been forgotten directly. Um, I, I think in, in these cases, it's good if you can find a good therapist who can help. Um, but um, also, you have to look at how you feel and how you behave in different circumstances. And I think the um, experience of anxiety is something that lets you know that here is a situation that somehow touching your wounded part of the self, and this is expressing itself as anxiety, and um, be very kind to the self, very gentle with the self, and um, give yourself that experience of being with God, being protected by the protector, and um, move forward, uh, take as much spiritual strength as you can, and you will um, be able to make steps forward. As one goes through the journey, <clears throat> it can happen that being in yoga actually becomes more difficult. Um, what to do? <laughs> I think that's a very, very important question because definitely there are going to be periods where yoga is much more difficult. And um, I think it's as it should be, uh, because every so often, you know, if things are easy, you become a bit casual, but when things become difficult, then you become a bit alert that, oh, what's going on? What should I do about this? And um, then you have to really look at your toolbox that you have and start using different tools. Um, you can specifically meditate on particular elements of the knowledge, particular elements of the murli, um, sit with some of the pictures and think them through. You know, all of these things will actually get you going again. And uh, churning is very important. We receive the murlis every day. Um, because that gives us food for thought and meditation is really deep thought about what's worth thinking about. It's not really having an experience. That's not yoga. That's nice, but um, that doesn't prove that you're having yoga. Although a lot of people believe it does, it's not really like that. You need to practice um, and there's a picture that is one of the old pictures that people don't much bother with, but it's a really good picture called the four stages of yoga. And the first part of it is your mind is scattered in all directions. And the second part is that you have to decide on what you're going to think about and focus on that and keep working on it, churning on it until you get connected. And then you can open up and receive the um, beautiful feelings of having arrived at the destination of yoga that is proper yoga uh, and but a lot of people don't know but you need to know that thank you that's very reassuring because <laughs> yeah. it's really true that sometimes you sit and your mind is all over the place and I'm really very thankful that we've talked about, again, the power of thought. Because is it possible also, Sister Denise, to think that the reason why you cannot focus and concentrate, is it because your mind is pulled by other things? Is it karmic accounts? Is Baba and your drama testing you how uh, determined you are 
Well, you're in a course of study and the uh, study starts in kindergarten where everything is just play, <laughs> you know, and then you go further, you start taking exams and then you're in a competitive and it gets more and more and more difficult. And this is normal in any course of study um, of anything and you need to keep up with it and you need to uh, adjust your way of studying and your relationship with the study your relationship with yourself your relationship with god you know this is moving forward relentlessly and if you get left behind you you do have to catch up and um every so often you get thrown off course <laughs> and then you have to find your way back because these are realities and of course, you'll be pulled by karmic accounts and there'll be storms of Maya. And in the Murali today, Maya, Maya's job is to interfere with your yoga. So if it's doing its job, you do your job. That's why we're called spiritual warriors. We have stuff to fight against. And that fighting um, is a way of you asserting yourself and coming into your power. So a very important part of the Gita, you know, God says to Arjuna, stand up and fight and don't be a coward and just get on with it. Mm. And yes, we have to sometimes tell ourselves, hey, let's go, do this. <laughs> I can't do it, do it anyway. <laughs> you know? And uh, yeah, that's the way. <laughs> Sister Denise, another question here. Is it normal to perceive oneself more and more as foreign to the role, to the identity of the body? Um, it depends on the individual, um, but it definitely it's very important to understand I am an actor, I am not this role, but I am playing this role. So I have to play this role as a good actor, regardless of the role. Um, you may have a difficult role, but that requires you to be more skilled and that will develop your capabilities as an actor because the actor has to act and you have to play and deal with the circumstances that you're in and use your skills so yeah this is a question that has to do with sin so can we say that the word sin also applies the misinterpretation of your perception that is caused by trauma. Therefore, yoga dissolves this as well. Um, I think so, because um, it, it's really very easy under the effect of trauma and um, not quite understanding what's going on and getting caught up in obsessions or whatever, to do things which are really bad for you, you know, uh, and, and you have to snap out of it. And some people can, some people can't, but you need to be able to snap out of it and get back on track. Not so easy, right, yoga, but <laughs> really very, um, <clears throat> very beneficial. And you do get skilled, you really do. So stick with it, you know. There's a question here. Uh, you mentioned that we need to better understand what yoga is. So can you please elaborate on this? <laughs> well, I think this um, uh, making sure that you study the Murlis and that you select elements from the Murli that need to be thought about and you spend time thinking about them and this will put you into connection with your soul. It'll put you into connection with God. Uh, but you need to use the material that's food for thought that's given to you. That's why we have the study every day. It's for yoga. This is gyan based yoga. This is why we call this explorations of gyan and yoga, because it... All this study, all this discussion and everything leads to yoga because you think about it until you get it. And then you're stable and still. 
paradox is very important in this. There are many paradoxes in this knowledge. And every time you encounter a paradox, sit with it and think uh, until you really get it. That's yoga. We have worked through this, um, this subject. Um, tomorrow, I think I will try to talk a little bit more about this thing called Maya, because it did come up. Um, came up in the Murli today, and I think it's good to give a bit of importance to that so that we can understand how to keep our thoughts focused on God and understand how to deal with storms of Maya and Maya's interference in yoga and all of that. So I think that would be quite helpful for tomorrow.